Now, we are going to talk about the churches of the 5th and 6th century. Now, I, I really wanted to title this, and I don't know if Luke put a title on this yet, but he can put one on it later. But Infant Baptism, the Damned and Bloody Sword of the Dark Ages. Because infant baptism was the sword in the hand of the church state to plunge the world into the dark ages. They are, uh, that infant baptism, Rome's baptismal regeneration and infant baptism was the sword that was in the hands of the church state movement that literally plunged the world into the dark ages. It it plunged it into there. Why? Because there was an element of Christianity that was taught mixed with error that damaged the gospel message. It damaged the work. Certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. And denying the only Lord God, right? And our Lord Jesus Christ. And Peter says the Lord that bought them, right? And brought about themselves swift destruction. So at this time in the 5th and 6th century, what you're going to see is uh, there, there's, a, there's a series of events that took place. But really tonight, we're just going to focus on infant baptism. You know, maybe a little bit of Pelagianism, maybe a little bit of that, because it all kind of factors in. Because Pelagianism was infant baptism. Augustine's doctrine of infant baptism was really an, a part of an overreaction to Pelagianism. It, it really was. You know, you have to be careful. We have to be careful, and we've been guilty of this in some, some respects as well. You have to be careful when you're correcting an error not to go too far the other way in correcting that error. Amen. It's so easy to do. You can do it in your family. You can do it with your home, trying to have good standards and set things up and to do things right. And you can go over the, uh, all the way the other way into territory that really starts to damage. It really destroys the purpose of why you're doing what you're doing. Right? Well, Augustine's infant baptism was that tool that was used to really do that. And I say Augustine's because he's really the one. He was the number one pusher of it that really push the theology behind it the false i mean it's i'll be honest with you it is the dumbest sounding thing that i have ever heard in my entire life his argue i can't believe people think this guy was a genius because he sounds like he belonged in a nut house everything that he said made no sense to me at all his arguments were stupid and i'm like this guy is supposed to be brilliant and i figured out why i hate it so much you know why i hate it so much because it's philosophy that's, it's just philosophy is all it is. It's, it's his philosophical teachings of the Bible. That's what it is. And th their arguments are just plain ridiculous. He doesn't really have an argument for it. He doesn't really have one for it. Anyway, so that was the tool that was used. Brother Beller says this, with the Dark Ages continuing on, the hierarchy of Catholic institution exercised, Tremendous authority over the population. The Catholic institution was recognized as the official church of the Roman Empire, and the church was enjoying its power. Anytime you see the church, that's Rome. Understand that. The church, when it's in that context, by, by these authors. That's what they mean by that. Uh, let's see. The fourth century ended with the authorization of the new Latin Vulgate. Well, you can't have a strong beast system without a book to back it up. So they had to have a false Bible to back up their theology. So that's what they did, right? Just like today, the Bible Rome uses, right? What Bible is the only one that Rome outlawed? The King James Bible. That was the one that was really outlawed at the time. After, after its invention. I mean, all the scriptures were outlawed by Rome, uh, except for the priests that could pervert it. They were very good at perverting it, right? It was translated by Jerome from text edited by the scholarship of the Clement Origen, Pamphilius, Eusebius, Eusebius, Alexandrian school of texts. So you know what its theology was. 
Yes. This new Bible was an attempt to replace the ancient Italia. Italia. The Augustine advances. Theology also took the center stage as Augustine began a series of written denunciations of the B British preacher Pelagius. Pelagius believed in free will. That is, he taught that men was his, man was his own moral agent and must, must make his own decision for right or wrong. Pelagius took this to the extreme, though, in that he believed some could overcome sin and merit salvation. Hence, he went too far and got into work salvation, that men could become holy on their own and on their own merit. So what is that? That's heresy. <laughs> it's wrong. They can't. It's impossible. So uh, you see a number of Pelagians today, right? They believe that they, uh, Jesse Morrell is one of those, right? Isn't he one of those? little screwball teaches a false doctrine i can't stand them and I, I i call them out every time i see them wherever i'm at whenever they're around i can't stand them they're all a bunch of perverts they preach a perverted gospel they don't preach that they don't preach what the bible says and i don't i don't have any patience for it I, I i have none i just call it out for what it is yeah all it's just it's 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 wrong he believed that men could overcome sin and merit salvation However, Augustine took predestination to the extreme. Those not predestined were created for the express purpose of being damned to hell. Pelagius came to Rome to preach the gospel, bringing about the public debate concerning these things. So they were both wrong. <laughs> they were both wrong. You believe that? Yeah. And I believe down through the centuries the same argument goes on today, and I personally think they're both wrong. I, I, I think that they're both wrong. I think Augustine's system is nonsense. I think Pelagius' system is nonsense. I think Arminius' system is mostly nonsense. Are there truths in each one of them? Absolutely. Sure there are. Sure there are. It's just twisted. Right? And the Bible warns us about the philosophies of men. It warns us about being taken by those philosophies. See, I'm definitely not one of those Baptist preachers that lift, lifts up Augustine. Definitely not. Okay, so uh, Cramp, a Baptist historian, had this to say, and I'm going I'm to go to his writing first here. He has this to say about Pelagianism. Uh, he talks about the time of what happened right after the Donatists is when the rise, right after the Donatists came abroad for about 100 years, then Pelag the Pelagian system. He says, Pelagianism troubled the church in the 5th century. As Pelagius taught that infants derive no moral taint from Adam's transgression, it has been inferred that he was of a necessity an opposer of infant baptism, since it had then become generally admitted notion that baptism cleanses from original sin. Pelagius, however, did not deny the propriety of baptizing infants who obtained, he said, the kingdom of heaven by their baptism, which kingdom of heaven he distinguished from eternal life and represented as a kind of intermediate state. What is that? A bunch of baffling confusion and nonsense. But it infused into the argument. So imagine you've got Augustine with his predestination philosoph philosophical system. Then you have Pelagian who's trying to be the practical one, right? And say, well, practically this. But then his thoughts become completely heretical and impractical. And they're all following their own hearts and minds. Not the scriptures. Not at all. So he didn't deny infant baptism. Pelagian didn't de deny infant baptism. Cramp says this, he said, I need not dwell on such follies and therefore pass on to observe that as many in that age stoutly denied the right of infants to baptism, refusing to acknowledge the power of the church to add the ordinances of Christ, to add to the ordinances of Christ, the council of Melevi, Melevi held in AD 416 passed a decree in the following terms. Whosoever denies that newly born infants are to be baptized or affirms that they are indeed baptized for the remission of sins, but that they derive no original sin from Adam, let him be accursed. Such are the supports of infant baptism, the frail buttresses of the building, Justinian's mandate and that anathematizing decree of Melevi. But what has the Savior said? Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Matthew 15, 13. Much has been said respecting the contest of Augustine the monk with the British Christians on the subject of baptism. 
It has been supposed that infant baptism was then unknown in England and that Augustine endeavored to force it on the people as an integral part of, of Romish policy. Neither assertion is correct. There is no good reason to suppose that infant baptism, which had been gaining prevalence all over Europe by the zealous labors and powerful influence of Augustine of Hippo, had been kept out of England. We have just seen that Pelagius, who was a Welshman, did not oppose it. Augustine's object was to procure uniformity of ceremonies and to induce the Britons to adopt the observances grafted by the Romish church on the simple baptismal service of the New Testament. Nothing was said about children. Their baptism was, no doubt, gradually introduced into England as in other parts and ultimately superseded as it did elsewhere, the primitive ordinance. At any rate, we find traces of it in Wales in the 6th century. Whether compliance was refused by any parties and in what numbers cannot now be ascertained. Here, as in many other respects, there's a lack of information. So what he's saying basically is, that Augustine was spreading his, his false doctrine of infant baptism everywhere. He was filling everywhere he went with it. His writings and everything else, he was spreading it. What baffles me is that most people that follow Augustine's system, they try to take away infant baptism from that system, and I just don't see how you do that. Because when you take it away, then the reformers don't claim the Baptists when they remove that. They don't want anything to do with them. They don't, like the, they, don't, they don't like any of those Baptist doctrines. They reject them for the most part because they reject the church doctrine they, because Baptists hold to a firm doctrine of the church, which is not, which is not welcome with most, most of those reformers. I think the most weakest thing ever, if you take your church doctrine from Protestants, you are in a ton of trouble. Let me say that to you again. I have books from Baptists, from Protestants, from all over the place. But if you ever think that I would take my church doctrine from Protestants and I would look at the way that they deal with the church, no way. Because their church state model that they prostituted to the world that was used to plunge the world into the dark ages should have no, no Baptists embrace it. They should reject it wholesale because these, the, by the way, if you think Calvin, Zwingli, any of those other guys, if they hadn't rise to power or the Puritans in America hadn't risen to power, you'd be under that same system today if it wasn't for God putting it down by Baptists infusing Christian and liber, uh, libertarian doctrines of, of the faith and, and uh, individual soul liberty into the, into the founding articles of this country. You better believe that. You'd still be forced to have your baby baptized today if, if the Puritans had anything to say about it. And don't you kid yourself. If any of those reformers now could get their little greedy hands in this country and do it, they'd do it again. They would. You better believe it because that's their system. That's what they follow and that's what they believe. They believe it. They believe it. That's right. Yes, and they would do it now. They would. They, do you think they changed their doctrine of the church? Did they, change, did they change what they believe? No, they're not allowed to push what they believe on everybody else. They, didn't change, they don't believe in individual soul liberty. They don't believe in the Baptist distinctives. Those reformers do not believe in that. They, those Puritans do not believe those doctrines. They do not believe in the doctrine of the church as Baptists do. They, if you think they do, you're crazy. They do not believe that. Just take a little trip to Rhode Island and see some history. Take a little trip to, uh, to New England and see the history of what happened. And the only thing that stopped them was God Almighty from doing what they wanted to do. They'd have done it here. They'd have done it here. They were doing it here. They did it over in New Hampshire. They did it over in those areas. They banished people to the wilderness. They did it in Massachusetts. And they haven't changed their doctrine. They still believe the same thing. Yeah, after they took their guns and threw them out in the wilderness by themselves. Yeah, in the dead of winter. Yeah. They haven't changed. They would do the same thing. They, they haven't evolved. Their doctrine hasn't evolved. It hasn't changed. And that's why they don't like talking about those Baptists. They don't like to hear about the history of the Anabaptists. They also have a very dishonest 
history of the founding of this country. It is extremely dishonest and a flat, no, let me just say it, it's a flat out lie is what it is. But you won't hear that from most of your, uh, what's that guy's name? He looks like he's 13. What's his name? David Barton. He still looks like he's 13. I think he's like 50. Curriculum. Oh, it's in all of it. That's why Brother Bella wrote the book that he wrote. Yep. You bet. Absolutely. So anyway, that's what Cramp had to say about, about, um, about Pelagianism at the time. J.M. Carroll, uh, you might know him. He wrote The Trail of Blood, right? Remember him? Hope some of you know who he is anyway. Remember, I, get, I think we handed those out, didn't we, Brother Scott? We gave those out to everybody, didn't we? Yeah, I think we had the bigger ones, didn't we? Aren't they over there? Are those over there, Jacob, those big ones? Yeah, I think they are. Yeah. J.M. Carroll said this. He says, remember that we are now noting the events occurring between A.D. 300 and A.D. 500. The hierarchy organized under the leadership of Constantine rapidly developed into what is known as the Catholic Church. This newly developing church joined to a temporal government, no longer simply an executive to carry out the completed laws of the New Testament, began to... Let be legislative, amending or annulling old laws or enacting new ones utterly unknown to the New Testament. So they just made new, they made their own rules. They just made things up. One of the first legislative enactments and one of the most subserv sub subversive in its results was the establishing by law of infant baptism. I, I'm telling you this sole thing right here is literally the sword that was plunged into the world to create the dark ages. It, I, it, it just was. It changed everything. The churches became weaker. They were no longer filled with Bible believers, but they were filled with lost people making laws and rules in the church and changing things about the churches, and the churches were no longer holy. That's why you had men like the Donatists rise up. That's why you had the Petrobrusians rise up. That's why you had all these, the Paterines rise up. That's why you had all these groups, the Novationists, who were very active in this time still that we're in right here. There's 300 to 5, and they were still active at this time, and they still had a problem with Rome. Still had a problem. But this new, by this new law, infant baptism became compulsory. This was done in AD 416. Infants had been infrequently baptized for probably a century preceding this. In so far as this was newly enacted law became effective, two vital New Testament laws were abrogated. Believer's baptism and voluntary personal obedience in baptism. See, once you force something by the sword, once you force people to do things, <coughs> you no longer have legitimate results. You understand that? You no longer have biblical results. It's no longer the spirit of God that's working on the heart of that person. It's, it's you just forcing it by the sword. I mean, you know, there's one way to preach. Is that sword up there? There it is. I can't reach it. But anyway, um, repent. There's one. This is one way to preach repent and believe the gospel or repent and be baptized, right? Or... There's that way to preach, repent, to be baptized. How do you think the feeling of that is that differs? Luke, come here and grab that for me. Let me show you. Come over and grab that, Luke. All right. Thanks. Give me that Excalibur. Thanks. All right. Watch where you're swinging that thing. All right. Anyway. So, so Brother Paul, there's two ways, right? There's, if a preacher stand up and he's saying, repent and believe the gospel, or repent and be baptized. <laughs> Right? There's, there's a, a big difference in that, isn't there? One works on the heart. This one, out of fear of the flesh, says, oh, I'll do whatever you want. I mean, you got that sword to my throat. I mean, you better be, you ready to be baptized now, ain't you? Yeah. I know you're ready to be baptized now, ain't you? Yeah. Yeah. What's up there, me? Yeah. I mean, we can make the cross right on his chest here, just, psh, right? But that's, you see the difference? That's, that's what they did. That's what they did. That's the difference. 
Well, that changes everything. And then it's forced that, you, well, if your children don't get baptized, you're going to be in trouble. And we're not talking about anything light here, right? It was the law. As an, as an inevitable consequence of this new doctrine of law, these erring churches were soon filled with unconverted members. In fact, it was not very many years until probably a majority of the membership was composed of unconverted members. So the great spiritual affairs of God's great spiritual kingdom were in the hands of an unregenerate temporal power. What may now be expected? Loyal Christians in churches. Well, let me, let me, let me back up. Let me go to Armitage on this. Let's read Armitage on this. Because he has something to say about what happened at this time period. Right around the same time here with, you know, he, it's a span from, from Constantine um, at this time. And baptism, infant baptism and baptismal regeneration, they kind of go hand in hand. They just do. Both doctrines, they, they're the same pretty much. During this period, says, uh, says Armitage, the unity of the Roman Empire was broken, and it was divided into eastern and western empires, after which followed the migration of the barbarous northern peoples. When the western empire fell to pieces and the new nation sprang up out of the barbarian forests, the church also was rent by controversies of every kind, chiefly those concerning the person and work of our Lord. This age is marked by the total eclipse of true justifying faith and the simple method of gospel salvation. A dramatic salvation pushed it entirely aside, and our Lord's beautiful ordinance of baptism was used to push him aside and to take his place as the great remedy for sin. The absurd doctrine of baptismal regeneration had long been growing, but from this time it not only changed the whole current of Christianity for centuries, but corrupted its foundational truths. True, a few individuals still held saving faith in Christ as a precedent to baptism. The Athanasius decree, uh, uh, Athanasius declared in 8360 that our Lord did not slightly command to baptize. For first of all, he said, teach and then baptize, that true faith might come by teaching and baptism be perfected by faith. So Jerome of Dalmidia, 378, it cannot be that the body shall receive the sacrament of baptism. You can already hear it in their words, though. They're starting to corrupt things. They leave the simplicity of the scriptures. Basil said this, one must first believe and then be sealed with baptism. Faith must needs proceed and go before. None are to be baptized but the catechumens and those who are duly instructed in the faith. Several others taught the same thing, but for a long time there had been a strange admixture of error with this doctrine. Chrysostom preaches this dangerous heresy on the subject. He says, although a man should be foul, with, with every vice, the blackest that can be named, yet should he fall into the baptismal pool, he ascends from the divine waters purer than the beams of noon. As a spark thrown into the ocean it is constantly extinguished, so is sin. Be it what it may, extinguished when the man is thrown into the layer of regeneration. Then he solemnly exhorts those who are deferring baptism to make haste and be thus regenerated as they were liable to his judgment to eternal torment, for he calls trying immersion the pool of regeneration and justification. Well, that's not in the scriptures. See, the whole world, though, the Roman, remember, the reason why the sword of Rome, infant baptism, this sword, the reason why, the reason why this sword was so dangerous that this is infant baptism is because it was wielded by none other than the Roman Empire itself. So you have Constantine's bastardized church state, right? Which, let, let me say this very plainly to you, in, in case anybody not understand it. And I'm sure I've made myself clear before, but let me say it clear again. I do not believe Constantine was a Christian. I do believe he was Antichrist. I do believe that those that trace their roots back to Constantine are probably nearly just as Antichrist as he was. Because his system was Antichrist. There is nowhere where you can find any system like that that was biblical. It's, it's not. It's not found in the Bible at all. It is not the true history of the Lord's churches at all, period. 
But some of the writers of that age went even beyond this extreme, insisting that immersion and baptism wrought miracles on the body as well as grace in the soul. Socrates, the Christian historian, tells of a Jew at Constantinople who had been bedridden for years with the palsy. After trying all sorts of physicians, physicians, he resolved to receive baptism, was brought to Atticus the bishop on a bed, and when dipped in the water was perfectly cured. This was even worse than paganism. Ovid, the old Roman poet, had ridiculed the idea that lustrations in water washed away sin. Even that old poet said, Oh, easy fools to think that a whole flood of water can air, air can purge the stain of blood. And he's right. That's a lost poet that said that. Yet Christians clung to this heathen thought and incorporated it into Christianity. Blondus tells us that at Rome, Mercury's well purified from perjury and lying. But Ovid laughed at Pelus, who had murdered his brother Phocus, and thought himself absolved because Acastus had lustrated him in river water. So he baptized him. He said, oh, well, he must be forgiven then. A twin thought was perfected by the Christians of the fifth period, namely that sin committed after baptism was unpardonable without the severest penance. Hence, baptism was delayed as near to the hour of death as possible. Gratus also was troubled by this question that he asked the Council of Carthage in AD 348 whether a man so sinning did not need a second baptism. They mystified baptism. And then uh, I heard uh, a Lutheran priest. Are they called priests? Scott, what are they called? Priests? Lutherans? Are those, are those Lutherans called priests, or what are they called exactly? Do they call themselves just pastors? I don't know what they call themselves. But uh, those Lutherans, uh, their, their pastor talked about the saving waters of baptism. I, I remember hearing him say that, and I'm like, what in the world? Same, same dogma. Same dogma taught. For this reason, even Chrysostom pressed the, that men should follow this duty for duty's sake as sudden death might cut off the opportunity for baptism. Then its neglectors would be lost and those who were baptized at last would only shine in heaven as stars. Whereas had this duty been done earlier, they would have been like suns. Gibbon says on this subject this, and Gibbon was a lost historian, but he said this. The sacrament of baptism was supposed to contain a full and absolute expiation of sin. And the soul was instantly restored to its original purity and entitled to the promise of eternal salvation. Among the proselytes to Christianity, there were many who judged it imprudent to pre precipitate a salutary rite which could not be repeated. To throw away an inestimable privilege would, which could never be recovered. By the delay of their baptism, they could venture freely to indulge their passions in the enjoyment of the world while they still retained in their hands the means of a sure and easy absolution. Constantine did the same thing. Constantine waited until he was close to death. And then he got baptized because he thought that it washed away all his sins. You know, the sins of like killing his son, of marrying other women, well, fornicating with other women, uh, murdering people, killing them in the name of Jesus, thinking that he does God's service. He did the same thing. Further tyrants were encouraged to believe that the innocent blood which they might shed in a long reign would instantly be washed away in the waters of regeneration and the abuse of religion dangerously undermine the foundation of moral virtue. Let's see here. Yep, he gets into Augustine here, the, perse the persecution of the Christians by the Catholics, which we talked about. Uh, let's see, uh, Theod uh, Theodosius's uh, edict, which we've already talked about, his edict enforced uniformity of belief against all who differed with Catholics. We talked about that before. Uh, talked about the Donatist bishops. Uh, let's see. Compel them to come in, uh, Augustine said. Uh, but in earlier life, when he was a Manichaean himself, he thought it wrong to punish heretics. But then when he became in charge of Rome, Rome's heretical beliefs, then 
he punished heretics. Petilli and his Donatist opponent urged strongly that there should be no compulsion or inter interference of the civil power in matters of religion. Well, that's easy. That's because he was a Baptist. Violence, however, triumphed as usual, and Theodosius II commanded all books which did not conform to the Council of Nicaea to be destroyed and those who concealed them to be put to death. Still, persecution not only followed all dissenting Christians, but the pagans were slain for their paganism. True, the emperors were yet as much as the head of the pagan faith as of the Christian. See, those emperors, they were, the, they, they were Pontifus Maximus. Who is that? Right. He, he was the head of all religions. So the, the Caesar of Rome, he was Pontifus Maximus, right? And then when the Pope became Pope, he took on the title of Pontifex Maximus, Pontifex Maximus. What is that? Well, he's the head of all religions. Can you believe people still walk into a Catholic church? Isn't it, is it not hard to be believe that if you just knew that one thing, you'd be like, well, what in the world are we doing? Like, this is literally Babylon. We're, you're literally like standing in Babylon, like right there, right? That's literally what you're doing. Thus a heat, listen to this, this is a very bold and strong statement. The despotism of Theodosius treated his heathen subjects and Christian opponents alike. On the ground of a moral regeneration, Christ demanded love for all men. But when this heathenish system of baptismal regeneration supplanted the need of purity of heart, Christians inflicted the same tragedy of horrors upon the defenseless pagans whom they were sent to convert that the unconverted heathen had inflicted on them. Thus, a heathenized baptism belied the gentleness of Jesus in the most atrocious way. And its ravenous thirst for blood pawned his royal crown to deck the brow of hate. When the persecuting demon took possession, Christ's rebuke, ye know not what spirit ye are of, was forgotten. Hmm. Moving along. Loyal Christians in churches, of course, rejected this new law. Believers' baptism, of course. New Testament baptism was the only law for them. They not only refused to baptize their own children, but believing in the baptism of believers only, they refused to accept the baptizing done by and within the churches of this unscriptural organization. If any of the members from the churches of this new organization attempted to join any of their churches, which had refused to join in with the new organization, a Christian experience and rebaptism was demanded. So in other words, those churches, like when people come here, and if they want to be members here, just like you've seen people come here, Lutherans that have come here, right? They've been saved by the grace of God. They believe the gospel. They must. They show evidence of that, of th that they're born again, that they love the Lord. And then we say, well, you must be scripturally baptized to join this church. Now, some men would say, oh, you must be briders because you don't accept. You must be a Baptist brider and you must be this and you must be that. Well, I just call it being biblical. You can call it whatever you want to. I really don't care if you call me a brighter, whatever you call me. I don't care. I've been called all kinds of things. It don't matter to me, right? The truth of the matter is, is that this church has a responsibility to examine anyone that comes. And we have a responsibility to examine their testimony, right? And we have a responsibility for the sake of purity to examine their baptism and find out if they had biblical baptism, if they even know what it means. If they ever had, and if they haven't, then we ever, then if they're to join us, then they're to be like us. And if you don't want to be like us, then don't try to join us. Right? I have had no problem in my ministry telling people that did not want to submit to baptism and did not want to submit to the ordinances of the local New Testament church that they can go out the same door they came in. Now, that doesn't sound very nice to some people, but it sounds very nice to me because that's why you have doctrinal purity and you don't, and for the most part, by the grace of God. See, the ordinances are to protect the church. They are to keep in who are to be in and out who are to be out. It's exactly what they're for. God instituted those ordinances. 
You and I have no right to administer them differently than what he commanded in the scriptures. We don't have any authority to do that. Our authority lies in the book. Our authority lies in following Christ. So over the years, there have been people that could not join this church and left because of that. Because they, they did not want to submit to believers' baptism. They wanted to hold on to what they had. And we said, well, you don't identify with us, so you should go where you identify with. Right? That's where you should go. Because we're not going to change for you. <laughs> right? We're not going to. This is the Lord's church. It's not, it's not up to, to change with, the, with every wind of change, right? With every wind of doctrine that blows in. So that, that, that we're not any different than our forefathers from that right, from that respect. The course followed by the loyal churches soon, of course, incurred the hot displeasure of the state religionist. Many, if not most of whom, were not genuine Christians. The name Christian, however, was from now on denied those loyal churches who refused to accept those new errors. They were robbed of that and called by many other names, sometimes by one and sometimes by the other. Montanist, Tertullianist, Novationist, Paterines, etc. And some, at least because of their practice of rebaptizing those who were baptized in infancy, which is no baptism at all, were referred to as Anabaptists. See, the Anabaptists are the ones that Martin Luther said had a worse devil in them than the Pope. Well, he should know that was his daddy. Right? That's where he came from. That was his church doctrine. He never let go of it, by the way. Just because he got rid of some things, he didn't get rid of all of them. You can still see traits of the whore. And you still see it today. Go to a Lutheran church. They look like a Roman Catholic church. Walk into them. Watch how they baptize. Baptize. Right, watch how they do it. They do it the same way. Why? They still look like their mother. Uh, A.D. 426, just 10 years after the legal establishment of infant baptism. Look at this. Or listen to this. Just 10 years after the legal establishment of infant baptism, the awful period known as the Dark Ages had its beginning. 10 years after. 10 years after. Think about that for a second. What a period, how awfully black and bloody. From now on, for more than a decade of centuries, the trail of loyal Christianity is largely washed away in its own blood. Sometimes these names above were given because of some specially heroic leader, and sometimes from other causes, and frequently names for the same people vary in different countries and even in different centuries, which we've seen. It was early in the period of the Dark Ages when real popery had its definite beginnings. This was by Leo II, A.D. 440 to 461. This, however, was not the first time the title was ever used. The title, similar to the Catholic Church itself, was largely a development. The name appears at first applied to the Bishop of Rome, 296 to 304. It was formally adopted by Syracus, Bishop of Rome, 384 to 398, then officially adopted by Leo II, 440 to 461, then claimed to be universal by 707. Let's see. Okay, that's what it says. Yeah, I'm going to finish up with this right here, then we'll be done for, for today. Now, the sum of the most significant events of the first five-century period, says uh, J.M. Carroll. Number one, the gradual change from a democracy to a preacher church government. Number two, the change from salvation by grace to baptismal salvation. That was a major one. Majorly changed everything. Number three, the change from believer's baptism to infant baptism. Number four, the hierarchy organized 
the marriage of church and state. Number five, the seat of, of the empire changed to Constantinople. Number six, infant baptism established by law and made compulsory. Number seven, Christians began to persecute Christians. Or they called themselves Christians, right? Number eight, the Dark Ages. Number nine, the sword and torch. This is how they spread what they believed. The sword and torch, rather than the gospel, became the power of God unto salvation. That's how it was. What's that? Yep. Yep. The sword meaning by, by this blood, the bloody sword, the torch to burn them. Number 10, all semblance of religious liberty dies and is buried and remains buried for many centuries. Number 11, loyal New Testament churches, by whatever name called, are hunted and hounded to the utmost limit of the new Catholic temporal power. Remnants scattered over the world are finding uncertain hiding places in forests and mountains, valleys, dens, and caves of the earth. Turn to Hebrews chapter 11. A good reminder. Verse number 33. Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had a trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of, of bonds and imprisonments. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Of course, that's talking about the Old Testament uh, saints, but also the new. It's also prophetic, right? Speaks of the future, right? Because one day we're all going to be one in heaven. Those that are born again believers, there's going to be one church up in heaven, right? By the way, there's going to be, and that includes Israel and the church at yes. that time. Yes. You understand that? Because the Bible says God is able to graft them in. And he's going to graft them in, and we're all going to be one. All one. One day. All one. Because God's going to graft them back in. I believe that. Because I believe what the Bible says very plainly. And it'll all be by Christ, too, by the way. It won't be any other way. No other way. No other gospel. They're not saved by their bloodline. They're saved by the blood of the Lamb. That's how they're saved. One gospel. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, right? So that about sums up the first five centuries. We'll get into more of the, the fifth and sixth century next week as we delve in a little bit deeper and we're going to get into some of the catholic apostasy that rose in the fifth and sixth centuries it's important for you to understand like when did this major shift happen how did everything become like that this is how so i'll liken it this way here's the church of the lord jesus christ okay here's here's the church of rome at the time let's say that they were one well here's what happened the Lord's true churches stayed here, and Rome went this way. So there is a trail. There are only two trails, right? There's the Antichrist, Church of Rome, and there's the Church of the Living God, the pillar in the ground of the truth. Those two churches have warred side by side 
ever since. Because they were not of us. That's right. And that's who they are. Right? And that's Rome. So when people say Rome's the oldest church, no. No, Bible-believing churches are the oldest churches. Rome left us. Rome left the true biblical churches. They left the faith. They departed from the faith. And the seed of Antichrist is there. Right? To set up the showdown for the end times, right? Amen. That's what it's all about. So you understand that history. Now, Genesis, for your memory verses, we're going to go back to Genesis, because I really do want you to memorize the first chapter of Genesis. And by the way, you're doing really well. The kids did a really good job this week. Let's see. So, let's see, one, two, how about 11 through 15? Some of you already have half of those done. If you have more, if, if you're past 13 or whatever, we'll do 11 through 15. But if you're past that, some of you are already, you're on 13, I think, some of you. Uh, are, um, or maybe farther, I can't remember. But you go ahead and keep going, all right? You go ahead and keep going, but that's good. We'll memorize. that. That's, a fo that's the foundational chapter right there, understanding the creation, right, what God did. And th that's very important, so we'll keep, keep memorizing those. Um, and I might ask you some questions about, uh, about this lesson for this next week. Um, I guess I could ask you, what, what are the names of the two heretics that we talked about, that, that both the major ones that both preached their heretical systems, and they both preached them against each other, right? So one was Augustine, and you'll have to explain what his system was, which would include infant baptism, and then you'd have to end Pelagian, and his system of work salvation, his meritus salvation that man could attain perfection christian perfection right he could uh, be sinless in his own power by his own free will right which is a perversion of the scriptures a perversion of 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 free will perversion of what the bible says um Right. So both of those systems and both of those, you can talk a little bit about it. Maybe I'll quiz you and see what you think of it, what you can explain to me about a few of those things of what we talked about uh, next week there. But this gives you a good insight into the beginning of this with infant baptism being really the mystical and baptismal regeneration. Uh, those two heresies and what we call the sword, right? The bloody sword of the dark ages is what? Infant baptism. Right. And then, of course, baptismal regeneration uh, you can't separate really from that so we'll, we'll uh, further we'll talk more about that next week but you get a good timeline brother Beller really did well with compiling this book here it's a very good book and I'm using other resources uh, this week I used cramp I used Armitage I used um, I didn't use orchard this week uh, and uh, let's see I think that was it for this week Anyway, so we'll, we'll get to more of that next week. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for your mercy and your grace that you pour out to us, Lord. Help us understand the rich heritage we've been given. That you, first of all, died for our sins, was buried and rose again from the dead and gave us life everlasting. And anyone who's not saved, Lord, may they come to know Christ today. But also, Lord, a rich heritage of men and women that gave their lives for the gospel. They gave their lives for the truths of the scriptures. To have a pure church. To have a church that, that was not tainted by the, the world and, and false doctrine and lies. Help us, Lord, to remember that. And those people had the word of God that they held in high esteem. Help us to do the same. With our liberty, Lord, help us to use it for your glory and to spread your kingdom. 
Thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.